Uh, yes, as Tony has mentioned, there are many familiar faces in here, um, but for those um, who are not familiar with me as a, an exiled Govig, uh, I'll just first of all tell you a little bit about my background, then my involvement in the football club uh, before we get started. Um, my great-grandfather, Thomas Moore, uh, was, um, he visited the West Indies and the Cape Horn before he started as a fisher fish processor in Peel. As, and of course, um, his memory is still there in Timor and Sons Kip, Kip Acuras down on Mill Road. This business was taken over by my grandfather, Fred Moore, and his brother, Percy Moore, and they were also involved in the um, coal merchants trade as well. Uh, my dad, Tom Moore, uh, who died in 2016, was an electrician. And, and during our early years, we lived at 16 Glenfaber Road. Uh, and an indication of, of how old I am really is that I used to enjoy standing out in the back garden and watching the trains come into Peel um, before they ceased, unfortunately, in 1968. Uh, my grandmother passed away in 1977, and the following year, we moved down to the family home in 17 Athol Street, just across the road here. Um, and then in 1982, I got married and uh, no longer lived in Peel. And the reason for, I'll tell you the reason for that. Um, my first in, uh, involvement with Peel, I think, would be the 1968-69 season. I can go back that far. Uh, and it was a, always a tradition of the family, or my, my dad and I anyway, that we would go to the Railway Cup final on New Year's Day. No Boxing Day finals then. It was all New Year's Day. Uh, but more importantly, we would go and see Peel win the Cup. That was the thing. Um, but more importantly, we always went to see a, um, a very strange member of the, of the club who only played in Cup finals. Um, and I knew very little about him at the time. Uh, and he's here with us tonight. And um, I think Paul would say that uh, he played in eight finals for, for the team and we won every one of them and we, uh, he scored in five of them. But at, at the time, he was a bit of a mystery to me. Um, <laughs> one of the things I used to do following the club is I would always be collaring Ter Terry Vincent for the scorers for the away team, for the team that was playing away that week. So when Terry stood down as assistant secretary in 1980, uh, he called at a house in Athol Street and he asked, uh, would I be willing to take over the position? Telling me that it, all you have to do, Colin, is take the minutes every week and send in two res result sheets. If I had known then how much work is involved in running a football <laughs> club now, he might have got a different answer. So when Catherine and I decided to get married, for some reason, and I haven't a clue why she decided that she didn't want to live in our beloved Peel. So I said to her, they said, right, well, if we're going to do that, then, uh, then Saturday afternoons must be sacrosanct for the match, and Mondays every fortnight for the committee meeting. And we, uh, we agreed on that, and we've been married for 39 years, and I've been an official of the club for 42 years. So I, th I think that uh, agreement has, has seemed to work quite well. On that way. So, um, before we get into the start of the club, uh, our, this is our badge. Our badge was actually designed by a lady called June Parrick, and she won a competition that, which the club ran in 1980 in order to design it. And I think uh, it would be very difficult to improve on this badge. It, sho it shows the club, it shows the town. It shows the island and it shows football. Uh, and I, I think, um, as we say, it'd be very hard to beat. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows where June Parrick is now. She's not on Facebook. I've tried to track her down um, just to, uh, to see you know, how she came up with this idea. Uh, but uh, you know, that's one of the missing pieces I still have to find. So the club was founded on Monday, 1st of October, 1888, uh, at the Grammar and Mathematical School, which is uh, down at the bottom of Lower Market Street. Uh, it was actually formed as a winter pastime for the cricket club, who had been formed within the past 12 months. The, um, the High Bailiff, Bailiff, High Bailiff Lawton, he was asked to become president, and um, the admission fee to become a member was two shillings, and 20 players took that up immediately. 
Uh, the first match that we played was uh, against Douglas, and that was uh, won by three goals to nil. And unfortunately, there were no red and white stripes in those days. The colours chosen were navy blue with a white Maltese cross. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Yeah. Um, so, of course, uh, there's one or two of us who are seniors here, but none of us were at that meeting. But uh, 100 years and one day hence, we, we were invited to a service at the school by the Reverend Else, I remember, uh, who spoke. His theme was about talent. And afterwards, our great footballer, a great uh, character, Mr. John Bell, he unveiled the, the plaque outside, which you can still see on the left-hand side of the door. And although we haven't got a picture of the team from 1888-89, we have one from the following year. So can we have the next slide, please? The only thing wrong with this, of course, is that we have a rugby ball at the front. Uh, so... The club played six matches in its first season, uh, won five and drew one, if I remember. But for some reason, um, the committee, and we, as a committee, we've all taken some strange decisions over the year, but the committee decided to change to rugby. So as it is, um, I only know one player in this uh, lineup, and that is the player in the middle between the two men with caps, and that is uh, Tom Morrison Albert, I believe, uh, which is your grandfather. And so Tom was, uh, was good at football and, and uh, rugby as well. And, and one of my other memories, or oh, many memories of growing up in Peel, is the Morrison Stroke Frost chemists at the top of Michael Street and all those great big glass bottles full of uh, exotically coloured crystals <laughs> and that way. So um, unfortunately rugby wasn't a success. They played in the Manx uh, Rugby Cup against Manx Wanderers, and they lost 49-0. So, fortunately, we changed back to football the following season. Uh, and here we are. Yes, thank you for that slide. Uh, what I shall do with these, I'm just going to... I will go across the, um, the names, and then I'll tell you a little bit about one or two players from each, uh, from each slide. So, looking at top on the left, we have... Uh, James Butterworth. James Butterworth was a famous painter, as in black and white artist, who died in 1950. We have Teddy Cashin, Tom Kelly, Tom Morrison again. We have Ned Cashin. We have Johnny Hanna. Johnny Hanna was our best player uh, in the early 1890s, and he went away to be a schoolmaster in Kirkdale, Liverpool, and then in Manchester. Next to him is Pat Lace. And, sorry, first mistake. It was Pat Lace who was a schoolmaster. Johnny Hanna was our first player who went for a trial. He went to, uh, for a trial with Walsall during our championship winning season in 1896-97. And at the end of the back row, we have William Farragher, who was the cloth workers uh, schoolmaster. At the bottom here, we have Captain Kerr, who I'll come back to. Then we have John Cashin, Harry Radcliffe, who was a stonemason, William Quayle, John Fayle, who became Inspector of Police, Bruce Shibbon, who was the Mayor of a borough in London, and Edmund George Boyne, who was the licensee of the Craig Mallon Hotel. Um, Captain Kerr uh, revived the club more than, more than anything. Uh, incorrectly, people have, have said years ago that he was the captain of the Fox Day of Mines. Well, he wasn't. That was a fellow called Captain Kitto. Um, Captain Kerr was a Scottish merchant who uh, became the vice president of the Lancashire Football Association and subsequently the Manchester Football Association. Uh, he was resident in Peel at this time, staying at 25 Athol Street, down the bottom, which is better known as the Royal Hotel. Uh, and he went to the, to the uh, people who were involved with Manx football because there's no football association at that time and he stated that he would give five guineas towards the uh, purchase of a trophy if we ran an association cup on the island. So 12th of February 1890, the Isle of Man FA was founded. Uh, Captain Kerr was the first president and continued as president the following year. And because we, as a club, were a rugby team, 
the town was entered by peel cloth of workers old boys which was basically the same players who had played for the club the, pr the previous season the team reached the final uh, but they were unsuccessful and they lost 4-1 to douglas in that final uh, so next slide please uh, right here we go so I, looking at this picture, uh, I'm pretty confident that this is Mill Road. If we look at the, the buildings at the back, back of, of, the, um, of the people in the top row, uh, and uh, of course the wall is, is whitewashed many times since then. So again, we'll just go along the back row. We have a Mr. Griffiths, uh, Joseph Hanna, William Farragher, the schoolmaster again, John Corris, Captain Kerr with the Scottish hat on, uh, John Edward Kelly, unlike the John Edward Kelly we have now, and again George Boyne, uh, Tom Morrison in the middle, and then we have three Cashins, Ted Cashin, John E. Cashin, who was a schoolmaster, uh, Patrick and John C. Cashin, Harry Radcliffe, Bruce Shimon, and John Pat Lace, <coughs> and then in the fourth row, Johnny Hanna, John Fale, James Butterworth and George Sale. So again, very little change from the previous season. So these boys won the, won the trophy uh, in 1891. They beat Ramsey 6-1. Uh, again, something missing there, no trophy. They still hadn't uh, raised enough money to buy a trophy which wasn't presented until the following year or was nearly presented the following year. When, um, when the, the team came back on the train, they were... Um, escorted to the, the Peel Club club room, which was actually in Douglas Street at the time. And then they were um, escorted again, I think, by the crowd to the Craig Mallon Hotel, who all sang, Behold, the Conquering Heroes Come. So this is our first of our 32 Association Cup winners. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so uh, this is what I believe is the earliest action shot of a game of football in the Isle of Man. Uh, it's down at Port of Shee, uh, and I think we can make out the player on the bottom right hand corner with the, the Maltese cross, so it's definitely us. So we reached the final again in 1892. Uh, again we played Ramsey and we won 2-1. Um, following Tuesday there was a protest the two of our players weren't registered properly and the association ordered a replay. Fair enough. The replay was three, three all. And then in the second replay, we lost one nil. So not to be outdone, Peel protested that three of the Ramsey players weren't registered properly. <laughs> um, it was getting towards the end of May by that time. And after humming and hawing, it was decided that the trophy would be held for six months each. So when you see on our honours board, joint 1892, that, that is the reason for that one. And, and let's have a look at the next slide. Right, okay, so a year before that date, in 1892-3, we had some competition in the town. Uh, I wonder if that is taken in Crown Street, by the way, somewhere in that area, with those uh, sandstone bricks. So this um, team was originally called the Peel Rovers. They changed their name to Peel, sorry, um, Peel Juniors. They changed their name to Peel Rovers the following season. And then the season after that, they amalgamated with our club. And for one season, we were known as Peel United before that was dropped the following year. Uh, interestingly, th this team played their matches at Albany Road. So um, whether it is where the current home is, I, I don't know, but definitely Albany Road. Uh, and just to outdo the, the present club, this team wore, wore red and white colours on that side. So the players, I think we can see George Rice, a fellow of the beards Hood, called Daddy Hudson, um, unknown Bob Anderson, Cobb Fale, the tall fella, unknown Johnny Clark, Inspector Fale, and then the middle row after the first one we have Harry Nolan and Jay Hines, and then in the front row we have Stanley Lucas, Miss One, Levi Garrett, William Rice, and Wallace Bailey. Now the final two um, I wish to mention 
William Rice played for Peel in the 1899-1900 Cup final. Uh, unfortunately, during the game, he, he broke his leg. There was a temporary grandstand uh, erected for the game, and one of the spectators on the grandstand unfortunately fainted. He fell off the back of the grandstand and land, landed in the river, which revived him somewhat uh, that way. <laughs> the gentleman at the end, uh, Alfred Wallace Bailey, he was the captain of our, our team in the 1899-1900 Cup final, which unfortunately, A, we lost 5-0 to Ramsey, and B, uh, Wallace scored two own goals. So not a good day for him. Um, what, as we might have seen on Facebook this, this week, I've managed to find a, a seventh of our players who unfortunately died during the First World War. Uh, Wallace Bailey was one of them. Uh, he died of his wounds in Flanders in 1915, aged only 38, unfortunately. So, um, but he did obviously help us while he was here. Uh, so let's move on a little bit to next slide. Yes. Right, again, let's work through. Uh, James Kelly, who was long-term secretary and treasurer. R.B. Kelly on the committee. Stanley Lucas. Um, William Kegg. John Rogers. William Hudson again with a beard. And James Boyd, who was the treasurer, uh, who was a well-known retailer in Peel. In the middle, we've got uh, Mr. R. McNichol, John Cowell, Herbert Lucas, brother of Stanley, um, William Corkle, John Watterson. On the front, William Kay, Bobby Neen, and Willie Watterson. So we look at um, Stanley Lucas and Herbert Lucas, of course, they were brothers. And at the time, the club's annual general meetings and all their gatherings were held at Lucas's restaurant, which was in Shore Road in Peel. We also have two more brothers there, you can see towards the end, uh, John Watterson and Willie Watterson. And in the middle, we have Mr. Willie Corkle, um, three from the end of the middle. Now, despite what Eddie Convery might say to me, the club hasn't lost many points for unregistered players over the years. However, uh, in this season, Willie, we signed Willie Corkle, and we played him in a match one day after he was registered. Unfortunately, in those days, you had to be registered for seven days. Uh, Peel were deducted two points. And at the end of the season, we ended up in second place, one point behind Ramsey. So a bit unfortunate in that respect. Um, so, but better times ahead on the next slide, I think. Yes, indeed. Right. So we're moving on to 1907 now. Um, Top left we have Charlie, Charlie Kewin, I'll pronounce him at this point, Willie Corkle, Eddie Milray, again James Kelly the secretary, John Cowell, Freddie Quirk, Johnny Krebin, Jimmy Nolan, and again John Watterson, Sam Palmer of the newspaper family, Bobby Neen, and Willie Watterson, brother of John. So in this season... Uh, we finished top of the league, but Ramsey had one game to play and were a point behind. So in, as the season had closed, they decided that they would have a decider. But the decider um, wasn't until well into the next season, actually on the 7th of November 1907. And we won 3-1. And Bobby Neen, as Chris will know, is his great-grandfather Eddie's brother, and he, had to, he was working in Wigan at the time, and he had to come over on the boat, uh, especially to play in that, as he was the captain of the team. And we got the, the league trophy at the bottom. So on to slide 10 now. So not to be outdone, the second league team uh, also won the league. This is one of very few pictures of the club that we have that we don't have the actual names. The only ones I know is James Kelly, top left, uh, secretary Tom Kegg next to him. In the middle, uh, next to the man in white with the arms folded, is the wonderfully named Silas Stewardson, who was from Patrick. And at the front, the captain, we have Johnny Kane. So this team also uh, had to go to a playoff, uh, and they beat Gymnasium 3 1. And Johnny Kane was one of several players between this date 
1914 who would go off and, and make their fortune in some cases in the new world. What does uh, attract me about this picture really, and many of us in Peel and elsewhere will remember growing up in the 1960s wearing shorts, um, um, which were attached by snake belts. So snake belts were uh, uh, around for an awful, awful long time on that side. So, um, okay, let's have a picture of, of Michael, Kirk Michael. So this is a strange one, um, a, a picture not of Peel. And we're, we're looking at the man in the middle holding the football, and his name is Thomas Moore Milchreest. Uh, Thomas was the son of Joe Milchreest, the Diamond King, who, was, who as I hope many of, of you uh, present will know, um, made, his, made his fortune be coming back to live in the White House in Kirk Michael. Uh, also, as is fully documented in the Peel City Guardian, he attended a dog and poultry show in Peel on Boxing Day 1896. And, and returning home to his house in Kirk Michael, he took ill and died a few days later. Uh, he was our second president after High Bailiff Lawton. So his son, uh, Tom Milchreest, played as halfback during the 1908-09 season. Um, on the 20th of February, we played away to Castletown and unfortunately lost 3-1. Uh, Thomas uh, drove himself home on a 1908 Triumph, but unfortunately, between Blig Bridge and Moores Mills, uh, his motorcycle was involved in an accident with a horse and trap, uh, and he was escorted to a nearby house, but died of his injuries shortly afterwards. So, um, another one gone, shall we say. However, on the next slide, we'll show the remaining, the remaining team. And there we are, yes. So, um, still no red and white stripes, unfortunately. But top left, we have Tom Kegg, Tom Cotty, the goalkeeper, and Charlie Cowan again. Uh, Harry Kelly, the secretary, Sam Palmer, Bobby Neen, and Eddie Watterson, Willie Corkle, Ed Benison, which is not a Manx name. He went to Russian the following year, um, but we'll forgive him for that. Uh, Johnny Crevin, Fred Tia, and Philip Moore on that way. So a couple to tell you about here. Unfortunately, second from the end, Fred Tia was another of our seven who, who passed away during the First World War. He was a member of the Seaforth Highlanders, uh, and he died in 1917, again, in France and Flanders, um, age 40. But it's a gentleman at the, at the end who, I would say that we have had three world-renowned or internationally known footballers of the, uh, at the club. Uh, Philip Moore is certainly one of them. Philip Moore was the brother of George Moore of the Ragged fame. Uh, Philip went away uh, again to um, make his fortune in South Africa and he became a well-known politician over there. Uh, but more interestingly, he was the originator of the currency, the South African Rand. Uh, he started that and it's, uh, he's always remembered for that in, in stuff I find on Google now. Uh, he died in about 1981, I think, but he used to come back regularly uh, and make little speeches at the club's AGMs uh, in, in later years. So, slide 13. Right, okay. Um, hopefully somebody can... I, I can never work out whether this one is at the side of the cathedral with Lindale Avenue at the back, or whether we're at Heathfield House and Patrick Street at the back. Um, so if you see me furtively around uh, <laughs> houses late at night, that would be the reason, trying to see where this one is. Um, so there were no Cal Cup competition on that day. The forerunner was the Cap competition. Uh, and this side won, beating Castletown 2-0. Again, um, Harry Kelly. Uh, those who remember um, Barney's late Uncle Edwin, I do think that looks awful like him. I, I do know those Kellys are related to, to David and his family. And then we have F. F Kermode, Harry Crellin, uh, Frank Kinraid, and James Kelly again. Bottom, John Quirk, Willie Quirk, Philip Moore again, George Kacken, P. Quain and Joe Irving, Ernie Shimon and Thomas Cobham. So, unfortunately, no one to report on the right-hand side of the 
second to bottom row, Joe, Joe Irving. He was the captain of the second team at, um, very early in his career, but unfortunately he died from meningitis in October 2012, aged only 19. So life was a bit short and cheap in those days. Uh, so, okay, next slide, please. Uh, okay, second, second league team. Um, again, lots of good Peel Sandstone there. Tom Cotty, the goalkeeper. James Watterson, Harry Crellin. Silas Stewartson, uh, George Cacken, Louis Quain, Evan Klukas, and Joe Stewartson, Silas's brother. And on the front, Johnny Kane, Bertie Kelly, and Tim Kane with an E. Um, Harry, Harry Crellin, uh, I don't think is of who we know as the Crellin family because I, I think this is a branch of the family that moved to Liverpool because during lockdown I had some inquiries from there uh, from descendants of Harry Crellin who, who didn't have a family picture of him and fortunately, unfortunately we were able to supply two and they were very, very grateful for that uh, on that side. Even Klukas, I remember across the road at the Methodist Chapel, him and my dad for many years being involved there. Uh, he, again, but he went to the States, but then came back again in the 1920s. Um, Harry Crellin, another one who succumbed in 1916, he died and is, is buried in the uh, Danzig British Cemetery, even, in Mametz and that way. So uh, many Peel footballers buried all over the world, really. Um, so... Moving on to some younger ones, yes. Uh, so we say there was no Cal Cup, there was no under 16 or junior football, but we did have what was called the School Shield. Peel um, regularly reached the final, but, uh, but didn't win it for a while. Uh, the names are all at the bottom, and uh, if you can read all those, uh, my great uncle Percy Moore at the front, and uh, Benjamin Gregor above him. William Henry, the school teacher, he was a, um, where did he come from? He came from Londonderry, that's where he came from, yes. And this was the Peel, we had the cloth worker school and we had the board school. This team nearly won it, they drew 4-4 with Douglas Secondary School and it was, again it was decided that they would hold the trophy um, as shield for six months each. Although the following year, the last year before the war, we did finally win it. Uh, we beat Thomas Street 5-0 and a lad called Jackson Irving scored four of the goals on that side. So uh, that brings us up to the First World War. And, and at last, in 1920, we seem to have some red and white shirts, thank goodness, that way. Um, lots of familiar names here to me. Uh, first of all, Charlie Kewen, Arthur MacDonald, Bobby Neen, my granddad Fred Moore, Eddie Neen, Percy Moore, Ernie Sherman, Horace Vick, Eddie Watterson, <coughs> Leonard Sale, and John Quirk. So, first of all, let's tell you about Charlie. Charlie Kewen is spelt Q U, sorry, Q E W I N. Um, Charlie was a Daniel Lace of his day. He played until he was 1946. Um, Kewen is a derivative of Keown, and my dad always used to say he called himself Charlie Keown. What he wasn't called is what uh, Mr. Keown calls himself on the telly. Um, definitely not Keown. Uh, and, and I think uh, I want to uh, get in touch with him one day and tell, remind him of his Manx roots and uh, to get his surname correct on that. Um, Eddie Neen, uh, of course, granddad, uh, great granddad, great granddad. Um, and he had a baking industry by then. Uh, both in Patrick Street and in Christian Street, and him and later his son Teddy used to uh, stay up all night baking the bread and then turning out for the team later in the day. The gentleman, fair-haired lad, Horace Vick, uh, it looks as though he's got glasses on then, so I wonder whether he played with glasses. He, he went to America, died in about 1967, he scored our only goal that day in a 3-1 defeat to Ramsey. And then two over from him is Mr. Leonard Sale. Uh, Leonard Sale was our first superstar, shall we say. Um, he was a, a, a winger who would like to dribble people. 
He did get accused of hanging on to the ball too much, but then, uh, Mr. Convery, I, I think you were too in about 50 years since. Now, Leonard was born in 1897, uh, and his parents unfortunately named him Leonard Joseph Diamond Jubilee Sale, uh, which my dad, uh, who, who knew him in later life, said he absolutely detested. Uh, so he was better known as the nickname Tyus, T H I A S. Uh, so, as we say, Tyus Sale played from 1920 to about 1934, uh, and crowds uh, were generally happier if he was playing for Peel because they could expect, expect a good show. One person who's not on that picture is, a, is one of our forwards called Wilfred Tregellis. And Mr. Tregellis came from Ramsey uh, the, uh, the previous season before the war. Um, but during the war, he lost part of an arm in, um, in combat, um, but still played for us. Uh, and he later went to play for Maloo. But there was a lot of talk in the paper about whether able-bodied men should actually play in matches with, with disabled men. Uh, but fortunately at the time, they were all permitted. Um, so thank you for that one. Uh, this is a, oh, I think this is a wonderful picture. Um, we didn't... I researched the, um, the grounds, of course, of the club. Um, it gets a bit confusing before the First World War because the ground is called Tinwald Road. However, I believe it is called, the Tinwald Road ground is the same ground as the Douglas Road ground or is, is a field next door where the links are as well. We also, before we definitely came to Douglas Road, was, was in a ground called the Reist, which again is up in that area. But... In 1909-10, we played in a ground at Patrick Street below the vicarage, so a bit further over. But this one is close. This is called Close Cairn. Um, and many years later, I worked, in, as we all did, worked in the fish yards in the summer uh, where, this, uh, where this ground was on that side. And, and the following year after this, after we moved from here, we played on a, on a pitch called Brickworks Field, and I think that was over the hedge towards the brickworks, towards the power station end. Uh, this is, um, I, I'm pretty sh happy I can date this one to Thursday the 19th of April 1923. The reason being is that on that day, uh, my grandparents, Fred and Kitty Moore, got married, and they held their reception at Patrick Street. And on the same day, the Railway Cup final was being played at Peel, uh, which was Russian for Castletown 1 that afternoon. Uh, and there's a regular family story that my granddad got into great trouble because him and his cronies stood out in the backyard watching the match instead of uh, attending to his newlywed and, and the guests at the game uh, on that side. But um, plenty, yes, plenty of hedge tickets there, I would expect, as you call them that way. So... On to the next one. Uh, right, this is one for Mr. Morrison up there. We didn't have Masters teams in those days. What we did have is the Fossils, um, and they turned out against various teams, including the Parsons, uh, the Parsons including, including the famous St. George's centre-forward, uh, Vicar Jordan, who played for England as an amateur international. Players we have here, on that way... We have W. Clark, James Kirby, Harold Madrill, again, Bobby Neen and Sam Palmer. Uh, Cornelius Kay, Corny Kay, he was the uh, proprietor of the Peveril Hotel. Uh, Tim Kane and Tom Kegg, and Fred Kelly at the end. Fred was the first of our life members. He'd been involved with the club since the turn of the century uh, as chairman for many years. Uh, he was an insurance agent. And on front, we have James Milcrease, W.E. Cashin, W.H. Neal, Fred Quilliam, and again, John Watterson from 10 years previously. So thank you for that one. Right, picture of the early 20s. Uh, no idea where that was taken. But um, starting to see some familiar names to me. Frank Quirk and Tom Kegg, Charlie Cobbin, um, jo John Pugh and John Quirk, George Kay. John Kelly, Tyus Sale, Charlie Kuhn, and Fred Shimon, and Jack Neal, who was a regular goalkeeper in the 1920s on the front. Um, in 1984, uh, when I'd been in the job for a few years, 
I went to Douglas to Woodburn Road and I, I managed to interview Charlie Cobbin uh, for an hour at the time. Uh, as I say, he, he had played in the School Shield final in 1914, so it could go back quite a bit. Uh, I've still got that cassette. I'm 14 now and nobody's got anything to play these things on, so goodness knows what's on it. Uh, go, oh, can we just go back one there, please? I'm not... Thank you. Yeah, on that one. Okay. Um, the man with the f fag in his mouth is uh, John Kelly. My granddad. Right, there we are. Yeah, 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 yes. So, John's claim to fame. The Green Final started in 1924. And in the first game of the season, he scored four goals. And in the next game, he scored a hat-trick. So when the Green Final published his first, the first leading goal scorers, uh, John was top of the tree. Uh, unfortunately, he only scored one more that season, so he very quickly fell, fell away from that. Um, George Kay was the son of Cornelius Kay. He was known as Joy, uh, obviously a hap happy soul. And at the far end is Fred Shimon, who was a relative of mine. Um, Fred attended the Railway Cup final in 1952 and died on the way home um, so it must have been quite, quite a game, that one. Uh, had a, a heart attack or something. So, yes, yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, right, so here we have... Yeah, right. When we look at the facilities of the club now, they, they are second to known, as are many of the um, grounds on the island. However, in these days, the boys used to change in what was called the dressing hut. Um, that way. So again, we've got John Kelly, we've got Tommy Tier, we've got Billy Kane and Freddie Neal, Charlie Cowan still playing, and Bob Garrett. On the front, we have Phil Garrett, we have Sidney Kelly, who I re remember as a young, young man, Willie Corkle, Walter Arrowsmith, and John Quirk. Um, I haven't a clue what this is. It's, it's either a... I seem to think it's a represent, representative game, a charity game or something, because... All those players look um, quite old, uh, even older than the back for the, for the combi that we put out a few weeks ago, <laughs> that way. Uh, and also, Wal Walter Arrowsmith, who is Robin Arrowsmith's father, as far as I can tell, he never played a, a game for Peel. So um, I'm a bit of a mystery of the occasion when, when this was taken. Um, but uh, that, was our, that was our building in those days. So moving on to 1925, this is a well-known picture, uh, appears on Facebook now and again, and that way. So on the left we have Jack Jockin, who is our treasurer, our fullback Tom Collister and Jack Neal, the goalkeeper. The other fullback, Harry Quirk, um, then Fred Kelly, the chairman, and a young Harry Clark of, of the new agent's um, fame, renowned at the end. Eddie Neen, who's put on a bit of weight by that time. Uh, Bob Gorry, Frank Cannell, Tyre Sale with the, with the cap on, and Jimmy Walker, George Kay, Frank Quirk, and even Klukas. So, Harry Quirk played football across at a high standard, um, and when he came over, himself and Tom Collis were for the fullbacks for the rest of the decade, uh, and he was known as Harry Big Kick, so there probably wasn't a lot of finesse in his style of play that way. Um, who else have we got? Yes, indeed, yes. So, on the day of the final, two of our players in the middle, Bob Gorry and Frank Cannell, they, they worked for the steam packet on the SS Peel Castle. Um, and they were working that day, and Peel insisted that the game would not kick off until they had arrived and got themselves to the ground at Tremode. So the game was actually 25 minutes late kicking off. Um, but fortunate for us we did because we, we won 2-1 and both um, Frank Cannell and Bob Gorry scored our two goals earlier on in, in the game. So uh, that was the first, um, that was a good reason to defy the FA and hold out for what we looked for then. Uh, this was important for Eddie Neen. Eddie had been playing uh, since about 1907. He'd even fallen out with the club at one stage and gone to Wanderers. But he finally was back and he finally got his winner's medal, which he'd been looking for for, for some, some time on that, um, on that side. And we mentioned Joy Kay before. Uh, Joy went off to Australia to be a golf professional. And there was, there's extensive um, reporting in the papers about he 
and a colleague that won a foursomes match uh, in Australia against the then Open and US Open champion Gene Sarazen. Uh, and it caused a great um, excitement at that time for the standard of his play. Can I ask a question? Of course you can. Uh, yes, it, yes, the, cup, the cups are all around, and we're only allowed to take them out on, for dinners now, uh, that way, um, due to some incidents, which I'll tell you with <laughs> Rofi later on. Uh, right, next slide is of a young man. Uh, no, no, this one is all right, we've still got this one. Uh, so here we are, similar names, Tom Collister, Robbie Crellin, and Harry Quirk, uh, Tommy Lancaster, Charlie Coburn, and Frank Quirk. Ted Kelly, John Daglish, a young Jimmy Moffat now, uh, Tyre Sale, and Jimmy Walker. So, uh, if we look at uh, Robbie Crellin, first of all, Robbie could play goalkeeper, centre half, and centre forward. And Robbie, of course, Pat, Pat is a member of the Crellin family who, by my reckoning, have contributed more footballers to the team than, and the club than any other surname. Um, I think nine off the top of my head, Robbie, Billy and Jimmy, Brian and Kenny, David, Victor and Paul and probably one other who will come to me later on that way as well. But a great, great servants on the field of play to the club on that side. Uh, Michael folded at that time for a few years and that Johnny Daglish was a member of the Michael team who, who came down on that side. Jimmy Walker at the end, another one. He was to die uh, at the young age of 32 um, in 1931. So um, must be grateful that longevity is better these days. Okay, so on to the next one. A uh, very familiar face to those of us who were growing up in the 60s and 70s, George Clegg who played for the second team. Um, George later became the trainer of the club, uh, and the players at the time always tell me that the sight of George with his uh, sponge and uh, water bucket, which was all we had in those days, coming towards them, would uh, make many of them uh, turn into a, a Lazarus very quickly and get on with the game on that side. So, so that, that was George. Um, okay, on to the next one, a, a social picture, really. Uh, I do love the, the ladies' hats in the late 1920s um, and also the caps that the small boys are wearing. Uh, Eddie Watterson, if, if you've been paying attention, was in the 1909 Cup final. Hadn't played for a couple of years, but this year he was brought back to captain the side uh, and we ended up winning the, the Hospital Cup. Uh, and there's Eddie uh, picking up the trophy. And again, um, he was age 38 then, and, and again... He had uh, departed uh, this life by six years later, so at least a moment that everybody will remember him for that way. Right, uh, again, oh, again, a very familiar picture to many of us. I do believe this is Heathfield House, looking at the steps and the door that way. So this is the 1930 team. Uh, back row, again, are two fullbacks, Tom Colliston and Harry Quirk. Between them, Robbie Crellin. Um, and over the far side is Jack Jock and the chairman, Reggie Bell, Tommy Tier, Alan Gorry, and Frank Quirk. Front now we have Herbie Martin, Jimmy Moffat, Jack Shimon, and Tyre Sale. So this team beat Old Boys 4-0. Um, of chief uh, interest to me here is Reggie. Reggie, um, when did he die? About 2007, 2008. Reggie actually lived to the age of 102, which I think was absolutely uh, phenomenal. He, um, he played till he was 1934 when he had a motorcycle accident out by the cemetery. Uh, and in 1998, when we held a reunion for the 73 team, Eddie, you'll remember that one? Yeah. Uh, then I picked, I picked Reggie up and he showed me the extensive scarring that he still had on his knee from that accident, um, which has finished his career at that time. So at the end of this year, Harry Quirk, he went off to Stockport uh, and Reggie would eventually become the, the fullback uh, in the following seasons. So on to probably the, the most famous early picture is our, this is actually the Railway Cup winning team uh, in 1932-33 and definitely taken in, in Irving's as was 
uh, from the cathedral. Um, quickly run through everybody here. Uh, Tom Kegg, uh, Charles Kane, Captain Corlett, William Irving, um, F. Kane, Inspector Farragut and Johnny Creben, the former Peel Centre forward. Here we have Bill Jones, who was a trainer. He was a trainer right up until 1950. Uh, another uh, T. Shimon. Donald Colvin was the hare who became a member of the police, uh, went to play for Ramsey. Uh, Robert Carroll, Reggie Bell, the goalkeeper, Fred Collister, uh, known as Tiny, because that uh, picture probably doesn't do him justice. He was a very tall lad. Uh, Robbie Crellin and Tom Collister, Alan Gorry, Jack Shimon, uh, W. Clegg and Harry Clark at the end. The, the next five it was the regular forward line of those days. John Bell, Tyus Sale, Jimmy Moffat, Herbie Martin and Timmy Tier. In front we have uh, Mr. Colbridge, who I'll tell you about, Tommy Tier, Bob Gale and Frank Quirk. So here um, we have the emergence of Timmy Tier. Uh, if people say that Robert Tier is our finest post-war footballer, Many people have told me that his, his uncle, Timmy Tia, was the finest pre-war player for Peel. He went for a trial with Stoke at the same time Stanley Matthew was there. And I do have a letter from his wife, May Tia, about what happened there. And um, it's up in the loft somewhere that he, he was accepted but wasn't able to go. Like many players of that time, their work commitments uh, prevented them from uh, doing professional football at a cross. Um, this gentleman here was known as Wee Bobby, Wee Bobby Colbridge, uh, and he was the team's mascot. But as well as that, at every cup final, he would go around with a bucket and collect uh, monies for, for charity and raise many hundreds of pounds for, uh, for good causes at that time. So as we can see there, the cl club was successful. In fact, they were so successful this season that they, they won all four trophies, the Grand Slam. First time this had been done, they didn't lose a match. They did draw four league matches. They um, beat Wanderers 5-1 in the Association Cup final, Russian 3-1 the Hospital Cup final, but the Railway Cup final, which they'd never won before. It was known as our bogey trophy. They were winning 1-0 in the final when it was abandoned due to uh, hailstone down at uh, Malou's ground. But in the replay, we beat Ramsey 7-0 seven, seven and um, ended up winning all four. As well as that, the School Shield team won their, their competition and the CAP team won their final 7-0. Um, so all in all, a successful season, as we'll see on the next slide. Thank you. Uh, I do believe this is taken at the ground, but if it is, uh, you see there we have a, a brick hedge rather than the sod hedge. That way, with quite, quite a good height. Um, school Shield, in second, second in, and that way, so... Uh, of course, there's no cap trophy because the players would, would gain caps rather than medals for that. Um, and this, uh, this is, as many people in the heritage will know, uh, lots of postcards created of various events in the island. And this is a, a postcard of the trophies at that time. So, and now we have another picture of the trophies. Um, so this is actually taken upstairs in the Peel Castle Hotel, as was which I had many drunken nights in the 70s, but is now more respectable apartments. Um, there was an end of season dinner, uh, and I managed to find somewhere the menu of the evening. We had oxtail soup, halibut and shrimp sauce, roast lamb and mint sauce, and victory pudding. Now, if somebody tell me later what victory pudding is, I've not, not been able to find that. Uh, we had a special guest at the dinner that day. It was Dixie Dean, the Everton centre forward, who was a, take, a bit taken aback when he saw the Railway Cup. Um, and he was, said he was glad that Everton hadn't won that because they'd won the English FA Cup that year uh, as it would have given him a bad back carrying that home <laughs> that way. So uh, the team was successful throughout the, up until about the middle 1930s and then began a, a series of seasons where they were in competition for every trophy um, mostly with Braddon, which we'll see on the next slide. Uh, right, this slide we have. Yeah, we've got, now we've got 
William Quirk, the MLC from, uh, from Dorby. We've got, we've got Robert Cowell. Sorry, we've got Jimmy Moffat, Robert Cowell, Fred Collister, Frank Quirk, Sidney Curphy, John Bell, William Crellin come in now, Tyus had retired, uh, Walter Noble, Herbie Martin, Timmy Tia, and Bill Jones, the trainer, of course. So after being a member of the committee and official for over 40 years, uh, yes, I've been party to some strange decisions that we've taken over the years. At this time, it was the unwritten rule of the club that if you were to play for Peel, you had either to be one, born in Peel, two, work in Peel, or three, married a Peel girl. <laughs> so, but this season, the club accepted the gentleman in the middle of front row, Walter Noble, who was uh, an international, I think he came from St George's, if I remember. But he was a fullback. So for this final, for some obscure reason, which I can't get to the bottom of, Walter Noble, the fullback, was placed at centre forward, and Jimmy Moffat, our goal scoring centre forward, was placed at fullback. And of course, we lost the game <laughs> that way. So um, Mo Moffy was quickly reverted to centre forward for the rest of the season. Um, and a year hence, let's see what we've got this one. 37 now. There's a Mr. Barton, Robert Cowell, Jack Shibben, Sidney Kirby. Frank Cannon, the goalkeeper. Frank Quirk again. Frank Quirk's in every picture. So um, Robert Crellin and Mr. Quayle on the committee. John Bell, Billy Crellin, Jimmy Moffat, William K. Quirk, Wee Quirk as he was called, and Alfie Brew getting in the team now. Frank Quirk, as you mentioned, played for the side from the cap team in 1920 all the way up to 1937. His... Uh, career ended ignominiously that in the last game of the 1937 league season against Braddon. Um, Braddon got a penalty, uh, which meant that they won the league and Peel didn't. Uh, and it all kicked off, as it often does. Uh, and Frank was signy died, which meant that, that that's your career. He was actually the second Peel player to be signy died that season. The other one was uh, Donald Neen, who would be, um, was that Teddy's brother? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that way, so um, they were not to be uh, messed with in those days, the Peel players that way. Uh, and now to a young side, the next one, getting up to that. Right, School Shield winners again. Uh, Harry Hill, the headmaster. Um, Laurie Ledley, uh, young Teddy Neen, Roy Wilmot, Cecil Moore, Frank McLean and Glenn Garrett. Harry Craig, and then the schoolmaster, the sportsmaster, or he call it. On the front, well-known Peel centre-forward, Harry Cowell, Will Keown, Fred Corgish, Alan Quilliam, and Alan Sloan. Uh, Laurie, Laurie Ledley didn't play much for us, but his, his brother Bernard did um, quite a bit. Uh, I did hear one tale that uh, in one second team game, the, uh, the Bernard was opposite, a very fast winger for the opposition, and somebody from the crowd shouted, hit him, Bernard. And Bernard did, yes. <laughs> that way, so that was the end of him. Uh, on a poignant note, the second man, second lad from the right and next to the schoolmaster is a young man called Harry Craig. As far as I know, Harry Craig is the only one of our players who died uh, in service in the Second World War. He was on HMS Holcomb, uh, escorting a convoy to Algeria. Uh, when his ship was uh, hit uh, by a missile from a U-boat uh, in 1943. Uh, so we lost him as well, aged only 20. Harry Cowell, of course, became our uh, centre forward uh, in the 1950s, one of only four players that I know of who scored 300 goals for the, cl for the club And that way. So, a um, couple more before I have a, a little break and a drink of water. So let's get some committee now. Uh, um, now again, the two on the right at the top and the one on the right at the bottom, I don't know them. So if anybody knows those three, let me know on a postcard on there. But we do have some well-known Peel gentlemen there. We have Walter Jenkinson. We have Robbie Crellin and John Bell, who were the players' representatives. P. Quayle, uh, who looks a bit red in the face. 
and R. Barton on the front, and of course Tommy Wilson, Harry Clark, George Moore, and George Gale. So first of all, of course, Tommy Wilson, first sighting of Tommy Wilson. Uh, Tommy was still on the committee in 1982, in my first couple of years. So as far as I can work out, he did 46 years service, including the war years when he was trustee of what became known as Peel Football Club. Uh, so I've got four years to go to catch Tom, Tommy, so uh, uh, hopefully I can, I can do that. Um, but the main man on this picture, of course, is George Moore. Um, George Moore, in, we bought the ground in 1957 with the aid of, of a grant, shall we say, of £1,000 from George Moore. The only stipulation he made was that, um, that if he, the club accepted this money, then we wouldn't uh, play football on Sundays, uh, which worked well for many years. However, in the early 1970s, the Hospital Cup competition was switched to a Sunday afternoon and Sunday evenings as well. Uh, and A, the cl club, which was very successful at the time, had to play home matches away for a couple of years. But secondly, we had to raise the money to pay George back his, his £1,000. But it's fair to say that uh, reading the archives that we found it very difficult to, to buy a ground. Uh, the Irving family were not uh, keen to sell it to us for many years. Uh, also, where the park is in Westview, we tried to buy that in the early 1950s, but it was deemed to be too small. Um, so we were able to buy our, our present home and hopefully our home for many, many years to come. So, okay, on to 1938. Uh, this match is played at Four Roads, uh, Port St Mary, which was Russian's ground bef before their present one. Uh, team is starting to change a little bit now, but Robert Cowell, a young Eric Gale, Sidney Curphy, and Robbie Crellin, Alfie Brew, and a young Henry Hartley. Okay, John Bell, um, Billy Crellin, Willie Quirk, Arthur McNeegan, and of course Timmy Tia. During this season, all the finals were against uh, Braddon. We won. Uh, we only won one out of the three. The last one, the Hospital Cup. However, in the, in the run-up to this final, uh, a referee called Mr. McLean was appointed, and the club refused to play under uh, under the, under this referee. In the interests of charity, uh, the FA reluctantly changed the referee, and we we won the game two nil. Um, However, at the following executive meeting, uh, it was proposed that the club be suspended and its league form uh, be um, wiped, wiped off from the table for its, its unsporting um, behaviour. And, and this was agreed, which was a pity because there was one league game left against Braddon of all people and we were only a point behind at that time. So... One more slide before the interval. This is a very poor one. I've never been managed to be able to find a, uh, an original of this, um, but it does have, it does have some interest um, for the following reason uh, on that way. So Robert Carroll, Eric Gale, Sidney Curphy. The goalkeeper is Donald Rice, um, Alfie Brew and Henry Hartley, Arthur McMeegan, Willie Quirk, and Harry Lamb, and uh, Timmy Tia, and again, a young Jimmy Crellin coming in the team now. Uh, I just want to mention Harry Lamb. The, uh, in 1938, um, at that executive meeting, it was actually Harry Lamb who proposed that the club be suspended and, and thrown out of the league. He was at Russian at the time, and then for some reason we allow him to transfer to Peel. Uh, and he was a forward, and he scored quite a few goals for us that year. However, he's, he's better known, or um, famously or infamy, that in 1947... Uh, Harry was, was jailed for 18 months for bigamy at the Wiltshire Assizes. He later became a coach driver uh, and was formerly a St John's chaplain. And apparently, during the coach trips around the island, he used to regale the tourists about how there'd been a, a, a chaplain in a church over here who'd committed bigamy, bigamy and been put into jail. However, he no, never told them that it was him <laughs> that way. That way. Uh, so we come to the war years now, but I'll just have a drink of water, if I may. Thank you very much. Can there we go. Of course you can. Does anybody know, after Matt Meekin, which Matt Meekin's that is? Say it again. Yeah. Matt, after Matt Meekin. After Matt Meekin. Which Matt Meekin's 
Um, there was there was a there was an Arthur McMeaton who played a lot, and there was an Alan McMeaton. So are we looking at Billy? Well, I think it's Craig's father. So and Douglas. Lived down the road, right, yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember the Douglas Street McMeetings, yes, and that way. But I, I will. I do have a, re a register of where they where they lived, so I'll see if I can dig that one out. Uh, we're now into 1946, when football was eventually resumed. Um, there was no time for a league contest, but they did have the Association Cup, and the Hospital Cup, Junior Cup, and Cow Cup. And that way, so we have some survivors from the previous, um, before the war, and some, and some new players on that side. So from the top, again, Sidney Curphy and Arthur McMeekin, Wilfred Lowey, uh, Robert Cowell still, a young Teddy Neen, uh, Jack Quirk, Henry Hartley, Eric Gale, and Bill Jones, Ronnie Wright, uh, Willie Quirk, Tom Shimon, Timmy Tia, and Jimmy Crellin. So a few bits to tell you about this one. Um, when we came up to the club centenary, I sat down with Hayden Cubbon and Terry Vincent and talked to them about the best footballers we've had. And they got into awful trouble because they picked this gentleman, Ronnie Wright, as the, 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 they both said he was the best winger who had ever played for Peel. Unfortunately, of course, he left the island. He lived in Foxdale and was only here briefly. So none of us, none of us had ever seen him. Uh, but he did, they did say he was ex exceptional. Uh, Tom Shimon at centre-forward. Tom Shimon was a, a, um, a prolific centre-forward. Uh, certainly this season, I think he got 18 goals in, in nine games. The following season, he was working in Onken and actually moved to Onken. And Onken, that season, won the league for their only time in the history. So he's got a league medal for Onken. But halfway through the season, he fell out of them and asked for a transfer back to Peel. Uh, and there was a bit of a commotion uh, as of whether he paid his subs or not, which I'm very familiar with in modern days and that, uh, that side. But eventually he came back, and uh, as we know, he went on to be a, a, a player for Peel for the next 15 years on that side. Um, but the importance of this picture is that this final was played on Easter Monday. On the morning of the match, um, the Peel players got wind that the committee were going to uh, drop the goalkeeper, Jack Quirk, um, and as Teddy Neen told me many years later, they hadn't a clue who they were going to put in instead of them, but they, for some reason they didn't want, want Jack to play. And the committee went, uh, sorry, the players went up to the ground and told the committee that if you drop Jack Quirk, we're, we're not turning out. Uh, and the committee backed down. Jack played. He, that, the first game was drawn. We won the second game against Braddon 2-1. Um, but I would say perhaps the, the committee had the last laugh because Jack never, never played for the club again after that final. Um, that way. In fact, his daughter, somebody will tell me his daughter was, used to be on Manx Radio. Louise? Yeah. Yes, Louise was his daughter. And, and, and they used to have this picture down in, in the pub when, down south when they kept, kept that uh, side. So uh, let's go have a look at some young players now. Um, so this is the Cowell Cup team from 1947. And from the left we have Roy Killier. We have my father whose shorts look like they've shrunk in the wash. We've got Bill Campbell. We've got Ori McMeek in the goalkeeper. We've got John Prescott. And on the right, Donald Quirk, better known to you all as Deke. Uh, we've got Edwin Kelly in the bottom. A young Terry Vincent. Eric Greger, who was a prolific goal scorer, Eddie Cowell, and Leslie Robinson. Um, I'm glad we have this picture because this, of course, was the season that we first got a glimpse of Terry, Terry in a Cow Cup game against St George's, um, which we won 21-0. Terry scored 14 goals himself that day. Uh, there, are, there are two tales that I've had subsequently, is that um, one, uh, that the players were told off because they went easy on the good St George's goalkeeper who was only five foot tall uh, and secondly the Peel committee was so pleased that they they bought them off chips down the road af after the game so believe what you will on that again our first sight of a uh, Peel legend easily used word but Bill Campbell um, Bill of course everybody has tales of him uh, there are frequent reports in the papers of him turning up to a game on a horse 
playing in cup finals after having a nail driven right through his foot coming out the other side. Uh, and of course, on a, a, a not so happy note, it was Bill who led the partial walk off during the Railway Cup final in 1960, which led to him being suspended for a whole season thereafter. Um, Funny shirts. Uh, the minute books do say that in those days they had to have a collection of coupons straight after the war and they managed to get ra a new, raise enough coupons to buy new shirts, but unfortunately not, not red, and, red and white stripes. So um, I have no idea. Oh, terrible. But yes, in that way. It looks like your rugby shirts. So um, let's see who we got next. Next one. This, this picture to me is, is quite intriguing, really, because usually on all pictures that we see, certainly up until the 60s, we'll have the forward line at, at the back and the defenders at the top. Uh, and this is the first time that we, we ever see a picture of the whole 11 um, all, all in a line and that way. And I think uh, many of these people should be familiar to you now. Harry Cowell, Terry, uh, Willie Quirk. Teddy Neen, um, Wilfred Madrill, uh, Jack Gorry, Eric Gale, I'm trying not to do this, Alfie Brew, Henry Hartley, Timmy Tia, and Jimmy Crellin. The last three um, formed a very formidable left hand side um, for the club during the 45 to 50 era. They were regulars there. Uh, interesting, Jack, when I, when I knew Jack in the P Legion in the 1970s, he was a bit bigger than that, shall we say. <laughs> uh, and then at the end of this season, uh, we won this, we beat Ramsey 7-3 in this one, by the way. Uh, but at the end of the season, Willie Quirk uh, fulfilled a, pro a promise. He left the club to go and join the newly formed St John's side. Uh, amazingly, uh, amongst the players who also left to join was, was Harry Lamb, so obviously he hadn't been incarcerated by that time. Um, <laughs> But when, but when Willie left, and it's, I think it's the only time that I'm aware of, the club actually uh, arranged an illuminated address for him, and his daughter, Steph Madrill, um, years ago sent me a picture of that, um, but I can't find it at the moment, so that's another thing I have to, to hunt down. So he's obviously a very renowned uh, player for the club. Uh, we've got a couple of second team pictures now, up to the end of the... Uh, that's of some well-known Peel, Peel names. So... Um, Bill Campbell, uh, we've got Bobby Gregor, who was also a long-standing official of the club. Uh, we've got Jack Neal Jr., uh, which is a very interesting goalkeeper's top on that day. I can see Eddie Lancaster, Wilford Madrill, and Dougie Radcliffe. And then down the bottom, we've got Jack Madrill, Wilfred Lowey, Harry Cowell, Jimmy Brown, who used to accompany Jimmy Crellin up to the shed for years and years together, and Roy Caroon. Um, this game, uh, I'm reliably informed by two or three people, was, fought, was away at St John's and it was played on a pitch somewhere between the Hope and Balacrane. And on the pitch um, was a telegraph wire that stretched over the pitch and the ball was uh, booted up in the air and hit the telephone wire and went into the goal, which caused rather a, a stink in, in those days. Um, so a couple of years later on, we've got another second team picture. Uh, well-known Peel character, Bertie Roney there, and Ken Simpson, Jack Greger, Herbert Brew, the goalkeeper, and then we've got Dougie Radcliffe again, Donald Quirk, and Frank Quirk, who was by now a uh, committee man. On the front, we've got David Dow, Jack Madrill, Morris Felton, uh, Jimmy Brown, John Postlewaite, and Eddie Corlett. Um, I think Morris Felton's probably got the uh, probably one of only two people I'm aware who actually transferred from the club to the RAF team, so uh, that way. Um, and also on the one, two, three, third along, we've got Jack Greger. Uh, Jack, of course, is a, is a resident of Castleview, I think, at the moment. He's 90, and him and Donald, who are also 90, uh, I think they're our oldest surviving regu regular players now, so we, we wish them uh, many more years. Um, of following the game. And I think that's, yeah. Uh, that's it, yeah, okay. 53. Right. Um, I think of all, 
when I first started collecting photos of the team in the lead up to the centenary in 88, uh, this was the picture I got more than, more than any other to start with. Um, Teddy Neen, of course, Alec Bennett, who was a policeman, Tom Shimon, who was playing the fence by this time, Harry Madrill, Will Keown, and John Kelly, the butcher, Tommy Cashin, Billy McMeekin, Harry Cowell, Terry Vincent, Hayden Coburn, and a young man, of course, at the front uh, is that well-known Liverpool supporter, Mr. Robert Williamson, but we'll forgive him for that. That way, um, I, would, I did a couple of years after this was taken. Peel played a Association Cup match at Braddon, and when they turned up, three of the players were missing, and they were Tommy Cashin, who lived in Kirk Michael by then. Uh, he was snowed in, and Tom Shimon and Billy McMeegan were called out by the highway board to to clear the roads of snow. Uh, so we had to call up a few reserves at very short notice that day. Uh, so now a a second team picture. Uh, right, uh, this team lost the combination. In those days, the combination was split into two groups, north and south, and we won our, our section but lost to the RAF 6-3. Uh, and the players here are my dad, Tom Moore. I'm sure Tom had that coat 20 years later still, and that way looks very familiar. Uh, Eddie Lancaster and Ray Hartley. Jack Neal again. Uh, Timmy T hiding in the background. John Prescott, uh, Jack Lee, very, very familiar face there, uh, Frank Quirk in the background, and Harry Madrill, Alec Boyd, uh, young Roy Klukas, prolific goal scorer, Billy McMeekin, Charles Garrett, and Lawrence Quirk. Um, a couple to mention here. Um, I never did find out what happened to Alec Boyd. He, he went to live in the south of England, I believe, but um, I've had no, uh, nobody telling me what, what happened to him so, subsequently. Um, we do know what happened to Charles Garrett, second from the end at the bottom. Um, Robert Charles D Garrett died on the 11th of July 1961 in a, in a road accident in Blackpool, again aged only 25, uh, so big loss that way. And um, yeah, yeah, let's move on to the next one. Right, okay. Um, this is your picture, Tony, as I mentioned before. Uh, we lost a great young player, for a while anyway, in 1953, when Hayden uh, moved to Canada. So we've got Tom Sherman and Terry Vincent, Hayden, we've got Glenn Garrett at the back, we've got uh, Norman Radcliffe and Teddy Neen, man at the back, I don't know, and we've got Stanley Quirk, president, first sight of John Kelly, long-standing chairman, Harry Cowell, uh, I don't know that gentleman, if anybody knows him, second from the end, and Alec Bennett, the goalkeeper. So, Hayden, of course, was born in Australia, um, and he was a policeman, but he, he moved to Canada to work in the building trade for a, a mangsman called Harry Collister, who had moved uh, over there some years pro previously. Um, but Hayden would be back with devastating results, as we will see later on that way. So, next slide, please. At the end of every season, uh, I've, I've got three of these in a the trot, that a group photograph would be taken of the committee and the players and whatever they'd won that year. That way, so again, we can do this on. that way. We can say, let me find this one. Please. We can certainly do John Kelly, we do the Caroon. Uh, we knew Arthur Collister, the treasurer. I think that's uh, Bobby Gregor. Just, just bear with me. Let me find this one. Okay, let's move on. Let's do what we can do. Eric T on the front. Eric T, Tommy Cash, and Hayden. Uh, Harry Kell and Terry Vincent and Eric Greger, John Kelly, Teddy Neen, Will Keown, Alec Bennett, Glenn Garrett, Tom Sherman, and Harry Madrill. Uh, Tommy Wilson, of course, and behind them. Amongst them, we've got uh, Arthur Collister, I can see, Percy Moore, Timmy Tier, George Vick, uh, Norman Wilson at the end as well, on that side. 
Okay. Very well, couple more minutes. Uh, just get. Uh, found, yes, found, found the names on that one now. Yes, but uh, um, so I was going to mention Will Kilm, but he's also on this one. Will Kilm was the first player to score a goal in a cup final at the Bowl when it was open in 1950s. It was the previous season. We beat St George's 5-1, and he scored from about 25 yards. So again, this is an end of season picture. Uh, Lawrence Quirk with Will, uh, Tommy Cashin, Alec, Glenn Garrett, Bill Campbell, Greg Eric Greger, Roy Lucas, Tom Shimon, Harry Cowell, and Billy McNeegan. So, team is not not changing very much at this time, and that way. So Roy Lucas, Roy Lucas. Um, I, we, I often wonder what sort of a footballer he'd have become. Roy scored 150 goals for the club before the age of 21. He scored 55 goals for the first team one season. And two years after this, he scored, had scored 42 goals before a, an incident ended his career. Um, I do find it interesting that we haven't been able to buy the, the team a set of shorts by this time. They've all got different ones. Bill's look is a bit longer than some of the other ones at this stage, and that way. So, on to the next one, please. Yeah, an action picture. Um, this one is a, bit, is a bit of a mystery to me, actually, and that way, as we'll see why. The reason being is that in 1970, there's a pages and pages in the minute book of the building of the shed uh, in 1970. However, here we are in 1955, and we definitely have the shed at, at that stage. Um, so uh, I, I need to find out when the shed was actually built at that time. Oh, I've got some names here. Yes, we're on track now. So we've got Ken Gilbertson from This Is Old Boys, Roy Klukas, missing one, then Harry, Harry Cowell behind Teddy Neen, Murray Watterson, who played for us for a bit, Herbie Kelly, the old boy stalwart, <coughs> Harold Kane, and Ori Tia, the goalkeeper. Uh, these days, we often get complaints from the players about the state of the pitch, but I think if they had to play in, in that one, uh, they'd be happy enough with what they've got. So thank you for that one. And here's the shed in the uh, more modern times. Uh, Will Keown, Jimmy Brown, I see my dad, Tony Corkle, not paying attention as usual. Uh, Terry Vincent, um, Brian Lease over in the far end. Um, the shed is, is where, shall we say, those who have seen it all and done it all stand uh, and woe betide a young player who um, upsets them during a game. The leader of the shed for many years was called Tiddles Moore and one young player was, was going past and made a bit of a, a Hoss's, Hoss's backside sort of thing and Tiddles uh, berated him and he said to Tiddles, he said, oh, you know, come on, I'm doing my best, come on. And Tiddles was taught was, well, if you're doing your best, I'd hate to see you doing your worst. So, I think so. so they could be very, dis very destructive on uh, that side. So um, thank you. And next. Right, here we are. Uh, as we say, the, the combination uh, played in sections. And this is, again, the Peel team that won their section and played in the final at Duncan Park. Uh, the, I don't know if you've spotted what was wrong in that picture. Um, and if you haven't, there's only 10 players. So we, we played um, Onken uh, in this match and the missing player is Harry Madrill. Harry was at the time working on a boat, uh, sorry, he was working at Runcorn and so on the day of the match he was whisked by boat to, um, to play in the game. Uh, by the time he arrived the match was well in progress and we were losing and my dad who was captain that day uh, tells me he, he and the rest of the committee were getting extremely berated for not picking something somebody else. Uh, fortunately, when Harry arrived, uh, tables turned. Uh, Eric Greger, the centre forward in middle left, scored four goals, and we eventually beat Onken 5-1, so all was well. So the players there, uh, we, obviously Tommy Garrett, the, the um, man with the water, uh, Robin Arrowsmith, and then we've got some Cowles. We've got Eddie Cowell and John Cowell, goalkeeper, uh, Tom Moore and Ray Hartley. Front of now we're seeing some youngsters, Stevie Quain and Gordon Lowey, Eric Reger, Lawrence Quirk and Eric Tia. So thank you for that one. Right, things began to change uh, towards the end of the 1950s. 
The club signed five members of the Air Sea Rescue Service and also some members of the mobile catering unit which was based at Mount Morrison. Um, chief among seas, of course, uh, second in was Brian, Bride Middleton, uh, and on his left, player who he played for one season, Mervyn Williams, Mervyn Geldart Williams of all, all things. And if you Google him, he still seems to be about somewhere uh, that way. Um, we now had a, a new goalkeeper, Teddy Kelly, who'd come from St. John's. Teddy Neen, Tommy Cash, and Tom Shimon at the front. Hayden was back. Billy McMeekin, young Biff Lowey, Terry Vincent, and Harry Cowell. So we reached the final uh, again in, in 1957. Um, but because Hayden was back, uh, our centre forward Roy Klukas, again he'd scored 42 goals already that season, including 10 in one match for the combination, uh, but he was dropped to allow Hayden to play. Um, we lost the final 7-3. Uh, Roy never played for us again, he transferred to St John's and the following season St John's of all our teams beat us 6-0 and, and Roy was instrumental in that victory. So uh, he, got, he got his own back for, again, another committee decision. Um, on to the next one, and this is just shows the crowds again. Not just FC Alaman that gets big crowds. Uh, and here was uh, our stalwarts, Tommy, Terry, um, Teddy, and Tom Shimon leaving the game uh, with runners-up medals these days for a change. Thank you. Right, 57, 58. Right, yes, here we are. Uh, so these should 99% be familiar to everybody. George Clegg, uh, Mr. Colvin, Tommy Cashin, uh, Leslie Holzall, who's still very much with us, uh, Alan Sploosh Quirk, again, who is, uh, Bill Campbell, uh, Tony Williams, who we'll come back to, <coughs> Michael Dawson, uh, again, is, who's still in good health, Timmy Tia, uh, Tommy Wilson, and George Bick. Front, we have Secretary Peter Klukas, then we have Stephen Quayne, Gordon Lowey, Terry Vincent, and then the stalwart Billy McMeekin and Harry Madrill with Bobby Gregor on the right. So a couple to mention here. Uh, on a sad note, Peter Klukas, uh, secretary, club secretary, he died in 1961, aged only 32. Uh, that permitted George Clegg to become secretary and that permitted Terry to become assistant secretary. So we have the line then. Uh, but, of course, the important man is on the back row, Mr. Tony Williams, uh, the second of our um, internationally famous uh, footballers, I would say. Tony was with the RAF, and he joined us for half a season and played 10 matches. In the, for the first team, in those 10 matches, he scored 20, 24 goals. He also played for the Ireland. Um, not sure what the uh, uh, rules were about playing then, but he, he played on... Good Friday in the international match as well. He later became more famous as the editor of the Rothmans yearbook, um, that big purple tome, which I've got three at home, and then following that, the non-league football directory. Um, and he's still, he's still with us. I, I, he came over here a few years ago and I, I talked to him up at headquarters at the Bowl. Uh, so obviously a man to whom football means a great deal. Played for the Corinthians, Casuals, I think he also played in the Channel Islands. He played amateur. He was an amateur international for the island, for the Channel Islands, and for England as well. So uh, quite a famous footballer in those days. So on to the 60s now. We're getting there. Um, yes, on that way. There we are. There's one, two, three, familiar there. Oh yes, got that one. Um, about three years ago, during my research down the museum we came across uh, many boxes of um, negatives that had not been uh, sorted out. And uh, amongst these, I found another dozen or so of Peel teams. Uh, and this is one from 1961. Uh, of course, we have Colin uh, now at centre-half on the team, Tom Shimon, uh, vet the veteran, uh, Teddy Kelly with his beard, um, Brian, uh, Henley Crow, the school teacher, and Alan, Alan Quirk. Front, we had uh, Ted's brother, John Kelly. Uh, we had uh, Mr. Lowey. We had Tommy Quilliam, Terry Vincent, and a young Robert Tier on that side. So, um, 
John, of course, uh, was the centre forward. We've actually had eight John Kellys, which makes it a bit, bit difficult over the years. Uh, in, the early, in 1963, he scored 58 goals due for the first team that season, which was the highest un, for us until a certain player arrived from Kurt Michael uh, that way. Uh, Tommy Quilliam was as prolific in two seasons, 59 and 61. He was very young, but between the Carroll Cup first team and second team, in two seasons out of three, he scored over 50 goals in each season. Oh, how we could do with one of those two at the moment, I think. And of course, the young, young Robert Tier, um, the player I grew up to, I suppose, like many of us of the age, grew up to idolise, um, 1958 to 1982, um, with some years away for his uh, teaching, teaching service in that way, uh, but a, such a marvellous player for us uh, during that period. So, uh, on we go, we're getting there, yes. Uh, and on to the next one, yes. Okay, I'll have a pause. Do you know what ground that is? Uh, I think that'll be that'll be King George V Park as it was known as then. Do you have two boys? Yes, yes. I <laughs> um, saw they call that photo bombing, bombing or something. Yeah. <laughs> right, uh, yeah. Uh, in the 1960s, we, we started to build the grandstand as we see now. The first bit of it was the can, canteen um, in, in good peel brick, as we see. We've got Harry Clark. Um, we've got uh, Eddie Moore, I think, who was the president. And we've got John Kelly, who was the chairman. And maybe the minute book will tell me who they asked to open up the canteen that way. I uh, can't make him out at the moment. So if we move on to the next one, we can see the canteen. Uh, we managed to take pictures of the committee, and that, so this would be 1962, and that's right. And here we are. Yes. So the bottom ones are easy: Terry Vincent, Arthur Collister, John Kelly, uh, Eddie Moore, the president, and George Clegg and Tommy Wilson. And then we got Jack Shimon, Timmy Tia, and Arthur, uh, Arthur Collister. See them? No. Uh, um, hang on, hang on. No, no, Eddie Lancaster, got the wrong page, Bobby Greger, George Bick, and Brian Middleton, and Gordon Lowey. And, that way. and yes, I can remember the canteen being like that in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, interesting, we've got a window there at the back. We are, we are talking about opening that up, but again, as, as a serving hatch uh, for people to, to go around in the one direction, that side. So that was that one. So on to that one. So here we are. So um, as ever, the, as we say, the club has had many great teams, but people always tell me that none have been so great as, as the Ladies' Committee. The Ladies' Committee was founded in 18th of September 1963. And we, uh, we'll be familiar. Of course, we have uh, Mrs. Gerard, and We have uh, Elise. We have Sheila Lowey. And we have uh, Edna Middleton, Kathleen McNeil, and Shirley Vincent. In the white, we have Christine Gerard, and then we have June Elliott, and we have May Tier presenting the cheque to John Kelly, the chairman. In front, Terry, uh, Arthur Collister. Uh, again, if anybody knows who the white-haired gentleman is, uh, I'd be happy to know, and George Clegg. So, again, they have raised they and their successors, and they include Elaine and, and Hazel, and many, many others have been instrumental in raising many hundreds of pounds for the club over the years, serving teas, and raising money in other ways, and the club could not have uh, survived, flourished without them. So thank you for them over the years. Uh, and back to a team. Um, I always find this one interesting in that up to the first, second World War, the players won gold, gold medals for the winning team. By the time my dad was playing in the 50s, those medals were silver. And here we have Colin, you get a pen, pen and holder set, yes. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> I don't know how long that lasted in that way. So this was a team that beat Russian 5-0 up at Balaclone. And as well as Colin, we see a young Michael Richards now, and Teddy Kelly, and a young Henry. Uh, that way, Alan Quirk, uh, shortly before he uh, emigrated to Southern Climbs, and Brian at the end, Terry, 
and we've got young Harold now. Uh, mascot is Mr. Tony Caroon, John Kelly, and Gordon Lowey, and Les Goldstraw on that way. Um, Michael, around about this time, went for a trial with Manchester City at the same time as Castletown's Ron Ronan. Uh, he later um, came back to be our president and a very active presence at a time when the club was a little bit in the doldrums, but he, as well as many others, brought us back to be the, the top side on and off the field of the club. So thank you to Mike. Uh, this is a rare picture, and it's the only picture that I have of Les Goldstraw. In fact, it's the only sighting I ever get of Les Goldstraw, if anybody knows. Apparently, he's up in the north of the island, but he's a very hard man to, to, uh, to pin down these days. Uh, Les, the following year, we won the league. Um, we won 19 out of 20, and Les was top goal scorer in the island. But reading between the lines, he fell out with the club after a, um, an Easter match when something happened, and he refused to apologise to the opposition. Uh, and instead of that, he, uh, he walked away from the club. So a, a big loss for the club at that time, unfortunately. But uh, let's see who we've got next on that way. All right, so as well as the first team, the combination side, as they were now called, was... Uh, was very successful as well. So here we have Robert's brother, Eric Wooding, um, who I've been in contact with during the first lockdown last year. Derek Shimon, uh, John Wilson, the goalkeeper, Colin, uh, the late John Crane, and uh, Deke Donald was still playing for us, Donald Quirk. In the front, the Quain brothers, Stephen and Raymond, Wilfred Lowey, Godfrey Kelly, and Robert Brew. Um, I'll just mention the last two, as well as football, of course, Kel was an outstanding golfer. He won the Ireland Championships twice in 1981 and 1988, whereas Robert, after his football career, uh, took to motorcycling. And he won the 1978 Newcomers MGP in that year. So, uh, both all rounds. So here we have a, a windswept castle town at the uh, Railway Cup final. And that way we beat Old Boys 2-0. Again, one of the Manx press pitches that we found. And uh, we have uh, Brian, uh, Teddy Kelly still. And uh, we have uh, Biff, and we have a, a young Kevin who's up with us tonight. Henry as well. And Jeff Hawkins was now in the half back line. Terry still, Peter Dawson, uh, Mr. McQuillan, Michael Richards, and Paul, Paul Barlow. So, um, what we can mention here Peter Dawson. Peter Dawson was very unfortunate. Both he and Derek Shimon each scored four goals in the first team game one week, uh, only to be dropped the following Monday because, uh, because Keith hadn't been available the previous Saturday and, of course, his position was insurmountable on that side. Um, Paul, this is one where I are. This is one of the pictures that I have promised you. Like, Paul hasn't got any of his pictures and I've got about six of them, so uh, my next job is to, to get you these. Can, Oh, we just go back on that one if we can, please? No. Or if we can't? No. Yeah, uh, on that side. Um, and, yep. Yeah, and I think that'll do. That will do us in that one. Right, 69 now. So, uh, some interesting on this one. We can see uh, members of the Middleton family, Debbie and Kevin. Uh, and I think this young lad on the front is actually David Lowey, uh, Biff's young lad who's now currently in Canada. And we've, so we've got Henry and Brian. We've got uh, Wilfred Lowey and Robert Brew. Uh, Godfrey Kelly, the eternal substitute. Uh, Michael Richards, uh, John Wilson and Alan, who used to come back intermittently uh, from New Zealand to uh, play for us. We've got Keith Roberts. Recently departed David Hughes um, and Jeffrey as well. Um, we seem to, people may now forget that Wilfie was a very fine winger for the club. In the Railway Cup final this year, he uh, had scored a, a hat trick. Um, but later that year, the team was playing Paul Rose in a Railway Cup semi final. Um, and the match was actually the subject of an inquiry by the FA. Uh, and, but what I believe is that Wilfie had, was kicked on the knee. Uh, by a certain Mr. Clark, and that effectively ended his, um, his outfield career, but he eventually became, as we know, a top-class goalkeeper as well. So thank you for that uh, on that one. 
Um, the club would never, never survive without the, the generosity and support of the town. Uh, and here we have um, a, re a reception with the then uh, chair, chairwoman, we'll call Barbara Cowley, of that way, uh, 1970. And we'd won the uh, Railway and Hospital Cups. Um, we now have uh, Tommy Wilson. We have Leslie Kelly, the town clerk. And we have Eric Crane, David's father. We have David Hughes, Hayden Coburn, Timmy Tier, um, Jack Quine at the back, George Clegg, uh, Will Keown, all people involved with us many years, George Vick, um, Jeff Borkins, uh, Jakey Kelly, John Wilson, Robert Tier, a young man, uh, Malcolm Shimon, Mr. McQuillan, and John Kelly, uh, David at the front with, um, let me just have a look at that one, Brian, of course, Rob Brew, and Godfrey Kelly. And I think if the young lady is Trisha Hughes at the front, if I remember from my youth that way, that side. Um, so here we are, another one from 71. The lad at the far end certainly looks to me like a young Raymond Golby photo bombing the picture there. Um, so again, we have George, we have Brian, who looks rather like Art Garfunkel by that time, I think. <laughs> uh, Rob Brew and Malcolm Shimon, Kel, uh, John Wilson and Robert Tier and Jeffrey. We've got David, and we've got David Hughes, Keith, again, I think young Kevin Middleton, and Kevin Hartley now coming into the first team, and Jakey e. Kelly. So, a couple of things about this one. Later in the season, we played in the FA Cup final, and John Wilson, I remember, dislocated his shoulder, and Roger Hawke had to go in goals that day, and we lost 1-0. Uh, but this, this team won the Railway Cup 1-0. Uh, the only goal was scored by our president, Mr. David Crane, who was in fact still only 15 at, at that time, um, at the start of his, uh, his wonderful career. Uh, and on the other end of that line, of course, is J.E. Kelly. Anybody who sees J.E. Kelly these days <laughs> must wonder <laughs> what on earth has, uh, has become of him that way, but uh, quite a character, all told. So on to, the, uh, to, my, to my boyhood heroes now. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we've got uh, this picture because it's the only picture we've got of all 12 of those who I say were instrumental in playing during this season. Uh, this, uh, this cup final has probably gone down in mythology. It was the Railway Cup final and it, we, it was PL6, Russian United 4. Uh, it was two all at half time and we were behind three times. And Gareth Jones got four goals for the opposition, all four goals. Uh, and... Keith only got three goals for us. Um, that way, okay, and that way, yeah. Uh, Wilfie, of course, now, now in goals uh, with Ruben and Robert Brew, Mouse, uh, Zip, uh, Wilfie and Jeffrey, Spud, Robert, Eddie, and Tony Scambler, David McQuillan, and again, Derek Neal, who we've only lost again during this year, was the trainer. They did say that it was interesting during 1933, we had a trainer from Liverpool, and in 1973, 40 years later, another very successful side, we had another Liverpool trainer that way. Um, so, yeah, on to the next one. Uh, I put, these, uh, put both of these on. For some reason, the reception at the Craig Mallon, I think, uh, is missing um, Tony Scambler, and the team picture taken at the ground is missing Robert Tier for some reason. And... Um, all those 12 that we mentioned there, as well as Kenny Crellen, who played a fair amount of league matches up to the, uh, up to the turn of the year. Um, and we've also got one of the committee. Of course, this is a team that won all four trophies in 73. Fred Vaughan's the chairman, Will Keown, Tommy Wilson, Eric Crane, Charlie Cubbon, uh, Harry Neen, the president, um, Harold in the back, who's now our treasurer, Terry, Timmy Tia, John Kelly, and George Clegg. Uh, so, again, they lost one game, we, we, as well as beating... We beat Russian again 6-0 in the FA Cup final, and we beat Laxey 4-2 in the Hospital Cup final in that side. So, uh, this was the team I grew up with, and unfortunately, this is a team that all of the all other subsequent teams are measured against, which is perhaps not fair on, the, on those, because we've had some marvellous teams since. Uh, on to 1974. Um, this is a picture from the Association Cup final 1974, and it shows Keith scoring a customary goal, it says. Um, Keith uh, McQuillan 
was born in 1944, so he's, he was 28, 29 by this time. Keith is the only man in Peel football history to score over 500 goals for the club. The Grand Slam year, he scored 69. He scored over 50 goals this year, so that's 120 goals in, in two seasons. Um, he was just um, a phenomenon. But uh, when, I was, when I was young um, and used to follow the team, we used to have a coach that was at the top of the town. And we always had to sit on the coach and wait for about 10 minutes till Keith and one or two of us ventured out of the Royal because uh, it was time to go to the away games in that way. Um, so this team, I would say, were as good, if not, not better. Um, if I remember, the two Kevins who were with us came into the side then. We were unbeaten right through. They won 46 games on trot. They were unbeaten in 52. And we came to the Hospital Cup final for the second Grand Slam. We'd beaten Malou 9-2 early in the season. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't turn up. And Malou won 5-2. And it was the turn of the Lowy brothers uh, who scored the five goals between them to... Uh, to end Peel's chance of a, a second consecutive Grand Slam, shall we say. Uh, and on to the next one. Right, uh, I put this one on. As we, as we say, we've, uh, you'll, you'll all know in the papers now, we've got such a great photographer called Gary Waitman with his action pictures. Um, in those days, though, you know, there's not so many action pictures, uh, but I do like this one for the, the vibrancy of the colours uh, and the, uh, the clarity as well. So on our side, we've got Kevin, uh, we've got... Brent Thomas with the hair, we've got Roger, and we've got David, and we've got Davey at the background. And as well as that, I think it's John Manley, Keith Kameen, and Tam McLaren for Braddon. Um, so again, we were still dominant here. We beat, we beat Braddon 7-0 in the league. Uh, the following week, we played them in the FA Cup and promptly lost 4-3, which was the biggest upset in Manx football for many a year. But by the time this was played in the Hospital Cup, we beat them 8-0, so parity was restored. Um, and now we move on to the second team. As well as, um, as, well as the first team being successful, we had a, a very successful uh, combination side with a, a lot of my mates in that team. Uh, this team lost two games in three years. They won three combination leagues. They won two junior cups. They lost the final of the third junior cup, but only when... Um, Wilfie had, had his, his ribs broken um, by Joey Ennett, I believe, in the first match for Castletown. So by the time we played the replay, we just didn't have a goalkeeper on that side. And I believe, if I remember rightly, Keith Cannon went in goals, uh, but refused to appear in the second half uh, in goals. And um, we certainly scratched. So we've got Wilfie, we've got Teddy, we've got Phil Killier, Jakey, Reuben, Reed, John Quilliam, Tony Scambler and Alan Colvin, Mark Hayes, who's now in Manchester, Sean, Sean Harley, uh, Neil Speed, Roger Christian, and Brian Kreller. I sigh there because if you look at the front, we have lost Sean, Neil, and Brian in recent years. And 15 years ago or thereabouts, we lost Reuben. Um, all went far, far too young, unfortunately. So uh, nothing more important than your health, I think. But... Uh, they were great, great times, late 70s, both teams successful, um, late nights in the Royal and other places, and uh, very, very happy times for the club and the town. Uh, but moving on, yes. Right, uh, so in 1980, things changed. Um, the, it was decided that we would build a clubhouse with a bar, um, and this caused uh, consternation amongst the old uh, members committee, I think. Uh, so we lost John Kelly, uh, George Clegg, uh, and various people at that time. We had a, a, a new committee, uh, including Mr. McQuillan, myself with hair, Richard Collister, uh, Malcolm Shimon with a very dapper jacket, uh, Tony Scambler, Howard Kelly, George Ingham, Raymond Golby, and David, Tommy Wilson still with us, and Fred Vaughan's the chairman, and of course Mr. Dennis Stewart. Um, Howard Kelly, I think, was instrumental in, in bringing Dennis over. He was a star for... Uh, Sunderland and England on that side, on that side, and that um, there's still a plaque above the bar of the uh, of the occasion. He also played for Man City. I remember a famous goal in the League Cup final, 1976. For those who've got YouTube, on that way. So um, back right. 
This is a very weird picture, and I don't know why, for example, somebody has cut this. It's the only, it's the only version I've got of the 1981 picture. Um, young Kevin Kelly now on the side, along with Barney Kelly and Kevin Middleton. Uh, Brent, who's still got hair to die for, uh, John Hacking, uh, George Ingham and Fred Hawkins, and, and David the captain, David Crane, Roger Christian and Eddie Combry. Um, I think uh, we put this one in because it shows uh, the actual height of the Ra Railway Cup, always reputed over the years to be the largest club in, uh, cup in Europe, and, uh, uh, but, but who knows. Uh, it's done, it looks a bit wobbly on that one, but it has survived a couple of skirmishes. Um, I have read that when we had the, tr the railway station at St John's uh, and Ramsey won the cup and we were uh, runners-up, the two trains were parked together uh, at St John's and as we were pulling out of the station, one of the Peel team nabbed the railway cup from the, the window and brought it back to Peel. I think Kevin, your father, told me, told me that picture as well, Mr. Christian Senior, on that one. Um, there's also tales about either this or another the cup ending up in the deep fat fryer in the middle chippy in the 1960s. Uh, and of course, it was uh, to great cost for the club. It was snug smuggled back to Peel in a laundry basket after the 2003 success up at Ramsey. So uh, uh, it's, it's done well to last year, and it is indeed a wonderful trophy. Uh, so again, next on to 82, and that way. Uh, here we are, yes, there we are. Right, in 82, uh, we again caused a little bit of consternation that we allowed uh, three new players to the, join the club. After Malcolm Shim, we've got Ray Hicks, we've got Robert, Brian Lees came from St John's, we've got Spud, Kevin Kelly, Steve Jackson, the goalkeeper from Russian, um, Steve took a little bit of ribbing early on in his career for us because of his uh, uncanny resemblance to Peter Sutcliffe, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and we have, uh, we've got Kevin and Derek, and then we've got Barney, and we've got Kevin Mid, Nicky Gerrard, Fred the Chairman, Eddie, Roger, and, and Davey that way. Um, so it was, at the end of, it was at the end of this season that... I, whether it's a passing of an year or start another one, uh, is that Robert Tier retired after 24 years. And um, unfortunately, his last game, we'd won the Railway Cup, we'd won the FA Cup, and in the Hospital Cup final, we were drawn to play St Mary's, who were a second division side who had no chance at all. Um, but unfortunately, I remember it was a very hot day, and St Mary's actually won 1 0, and the goal scorer was. was um, Goal was scored by a member of the Crellon family, Alan, uh, and so it was an uh, ignominiously end for a marvellous career for Robert. Um, but of this team, if we go on to the next slide, we'll see that apart from Robert, it, two years later, it was virtually, virtually the, the same side. Tony was now our, our manager. We had Kevin, uh, Robert Bantam, who will come back to Steve Jackson, David, Middy, um, Brian, uh, Les Wolferden from our sponsors, Ray Hicks, Nicky Gerrard, Barney Kelly, Kevin Kelly, Roger, Joe Kelly, Eddie and Spud, and various members of Canes and others at the front <laughs> on that side. Um, so let me just get, well, that was Tony, 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 Tony. Yes, Robert, uh, many will remember Robert, a, a great support of the club, a, a, a special needs person, but a special person as well. Um, he had some wonderful sayings like, he never saw Peel lose, they always won Peel 7-3, Russian nothing, which uh, took a bit of deciphering, or uh, not so PC, uh, about kicking people between the legs and putting them down <laughs> on that way, but uh, he, was, uh, he was a great character at, at the ground that way. Uh, Barney, of course, uh, another great character of the club, uh, he berated me once because I described him in a programme as being a a fine singer and a keen bowler. And he said, no, Colin, I'm a, I'm a great bowler and a keen singer, sort of thing. And he is, he's still winning the bowling competitions at, at this time. This year, of course, Kevin Middleton became Ireland Football of the Year, uh, exactly 20 years after Father Brian had won the very first uh, Footballer of the Year award, the Borough Rose Bowl in 1964. So we won League and Cup, but uh, this was the start of a, a bit of a drought, unfortunately. So let's see what happens then. Um, so, at the end of that season, 
Um, again, through Howard Kelly, we, we were able to arrange a match with the Kevin Keegan charity, the Sparks Association. Uh, their team was made up generally with former Liverpool and Burnley players. Um, and I had to remind myself who was playing. Em certainly Eminem Hughes, Ian Callaghan, and again recently deceased World Cup winner Roger Hunt were all at the Douglas Road ground that day. Uh, Burnley players included Brian Flynn and Frank Casper. Uh, those were the days before political correctness and health and safety. And I spent the afternoon on the top of the grandstand um, recording a, co a commentary for the game, which was a bit hairy in those days. There was, there was no scaffolding at all, but we survived on that way. So um, that was in Ju July, July 84, I think. It, it is, I think it's mentioned in the, in the book that way. So we reached our centenary in the next one, on that one. Um, a few more young faces now. Thomas Cobbin, Lee Kane, Brian, S Steve Jackson, Kevin Kelly. A notorious fullback of the old school, Nick Presky, Kevin Middleton, Stephen Ingham, and Kevin Christian, who's now a trainer. Um, a young Stephen Corkle, a very mercurial player, Martin Costain, Roger, David, and Nicky Ingham. Um, the club was 100, of course, 100 on 1st of October 1988. We actually played that Ramsey that day. I, I did ask, this was the days before Tony Meffin was on the fixtures committee, and I did ask them that I didn't want the fixtures manipulated, but could we have a game, home game of Ramsey, who were our oldest, our oldest rivals that way, and they allowed that. Uh, unfortunately, it paid off because we won 6-0, and the chief um, incident of the game, of course, was Steve Jackson, who scored a goal direct from a, a kick out that day. First time I'd seen one of them, although in subsequent years we've seen by Jim Murphy and Stuart Fale for Peel and Aaron Storey for Russian at the ground, uh, but it was quite a, quite a novelty at that time. Um, we did manage to reach a couple of finals that year. Unfortunately in those days, for some reason, we used to choose to have our annual dinner the day before a cup final in several years. Uh, and so unfortunately, um, we did, I don't think we won any of them in, in that one. That one. Um, but the team did reach the final uh, the hard way. We took five matches to get past uh, St George's that season. Uh, I think I worked out about 10 hours, three sets of uh, extra time. Um, and we thought we'd, perhaps we'd done the hard bit by beating them, but uh, old boys beat us in this game. Right, so... Moving on this way, uh, the club was relegated in 1995, unthinkable, uh, but to be fair, I think uh, I've analysed it and we were on a bit of decline for about two and a half years before that, we'd, we'd barely escaped the year before, we'd lost players through injury, Stephen Corkle, uh, uh, Tom Klukas was injured, um, people had left, Kevin Quayle and Mark Kelly uh, senior that way and we just didn't have the have the resources so here we have a really a brand new team um, see if I can uh, probably best to read them out and Nick Hurt, David Crellin, Rory Matthews, Kelvin of course we've got Ian Morrow, Colin Gilbert and Peter Kenyuk we've got David Rice uh, next slide's called Paul Winder, Nick Presky, Graham Gell, Tony Bennett who's in Northern Ireland now, Sean Dickinson and David Brew, Paul Quirk, Andy Rice and John Spellman, uh, Terry Harrison, Peter Richards, uh, Mark Smith, that's Skiff again with hair, yes, um, Paul Sheffield, uh, I must find out who the lady is, which is uh, not mentioned, Jim Murphy, Carl Bailey, Mark Hyde and Paul Crellin. So uh, again, uh, it's fair to say that we probably deserve to go down we only won three out of 22 matches and, and you don't win anything with that. But uh, if you look at the team about three years ago, we'd lost about half the team through transfers and injuries and other reasons. So uh, on to the next one. Um, we didn't immediately um, get back to former glories the first year, but the second year uh, Rick came over to the island and worked to be a physiotherapist at Nobles. And, um, and decided that he would join our, our club. He played for Manchester City in Oldham, and um, in this season ahead, it was probably his best season for Peel. He, he played uh, 48 matches all told, 
and he scored 47 goals, so quite a, a contribution then. Uh, the club, as I say, played 50. Kelvin played all 50 matches, uh, and that was in the days of replays and multiple replays, and it'll never happen again because we don't have any, any replays now on that side. So we won the second division, um, dropping only one point because it was only two points for a, a win then. And we, but we won the Association Cup and Hospital Cup, but both as a second division side. We also had crowds. We also had crowds of up to 500 at the matches. Um, and being, being biased or whatever, people say to me, oh, isn't this wonderful, Colin? Isn't this wonderful? And I says, used to say, but yes, it is, but where were they? When we, were, when we were suffering two years ago. But they were, they were wonderful days. Um, we, filled, we filled the bowl with uh, 1,500 people and, um, from the town. It was just like the old days. And it, was, it really was great times, and it was the start of several, several years of good fortune, which we'll see on the next slide. So in 1999, we won all the three cups. Um, and here we have Brian, uh, sorry, we have Kevin, uh, we have Frank Dunn, we have Tommy, Peter Richards, and we have Peter Kenyuk, a young Robert Cartier, Kevin, and Andy Morrison. Uh, we have Chris Hawk, Andy Neen, Kelvin, Mr. Daniel Lace, Nick Hurt, Chris Kane, Stephen Corkle, David Rice, and Kevin McGarvey hiding in the corner there. Um, Kevin only had a few years with us, but he has a great claim to fame in Manx football. The Isle of Man beat Burnley in open play in one of the Steam Packet Festival two games, and Kevin scored the only goal that day before going off to play for Morecambe. Um, in 1999, we didn't win the league, but in the last league game of the season, Mr. Nick Hurt uh, in the middle, uh, we played St. George's. After 25 minutes, the score was 0-0. At the end of the game, the score was 17-2, and Nick had scored 15 of those goals. <laughs> Um, Chris Hawke came on as a sub and scored the other two, but probably could have got another six himself that way. Uh, that way, but uh, it was a, a rather b bizarre, bizarre game that that day. Um, so back, oh, back, back one, back one. No, sorry, I'm too. Uh, so the final bit, bit of the jigsaw was to win the league again. We came to the end of the 2000 season. We needed to, to win up at the police, yeah, 1-0 to win the league, um, and we did that in style, we actually beat them 16-0 on 23rd of May 2000, the first of three uh, consecutive leagues, 2002 being the last time we've actually won it, and my fellow committee man, Sean Dickinson, asked me to remind you all that he was the manager the last time we won the league, so <laughs> that's his, his claim to fame on that way. Uh, so now we'll come on to the ladies. Um, this is a picture that we've, we've found recently. I'll just read them out first. Uh, Victoria Phillips, Louise Neen, Lisa, Lisa Kelly. Then we've got Megan Hindley, Joanne Dawson, uh, Vanessa Roberts, Christian as is now Sarah Shaw, and um, Donna Harrison. We've got Steph Madrill, we've got Anne Parry, we've got Shirley Dunn, Rachel Looney, and Nicola Parry, and Helen Cowan's in there somewhere, I uh, missed out. So the women's team, was started in also in 2000. The first game was against Castletown and they won 1 0. And Sarah Stanley, the trivia question, was the first person to score a goal for the women's team. Um, it's probably fair to say that they weren't very successful in the early days. Um, and I must thank uh, Peter Kenyuk and, and Tom Klukas who were instrumental in, in starting these off in the early days. Um, but since about the middle of the last decade, uh, we had a new trainer called Michael Corlett, and we've got then the current trainer, Luke, Luke Stewart. They have uh, been instrumental in bringing the girls' team up to the top of the tree. They've won the league, and they've won a couple of cups uh, since 2016. And, and with Luke, I think the women's team is in very good hands at this side. So on to 2004. Um, probably the, the most poignant uh, picture of the whole evening, really, is Tommy... Um, on 1st of September 2004 uh, in the Grand Prix Tom achieved 120 miles an hour from a standing start uh, and on the last lap he was involved in an accident at Balaf um, and he succumbed to his injuries later on that evening uh, Tom was only 36 um, his, he wasn't an out and out striker but his 
his average of one every two goal every two games, which I know 428 appearances and 213 goals, virtually one in two. Uh, and he was a great, great character and a great inspiration. Um, I do remember the time that, that he had got himself injured. He paid for himself to, to, with a personal loan from the bank to get his, himself sorted out. Uh, and he also abstained from, from beer for a long time to ensure he was fit. That was how, how keen um, he was for the game and uh, obviously much missed uh, as a, a road named after him here. Um, but more importantly, on to the next slide, um, many, many involved in, uh, in the, the family, but as well people like Neil Kane. Kelvin Dawson, uh, Graham Gale, but many, many of us were instrumental in raising funds to provide a, a permanent memorial for Tommy, which is the, the sports hall uh, at the ground. And that was opened nine years to the day after his, his, his uh, passing uh, and is, is well used by uh, many from within the town, but also from many from outside the town. It is a real community um, set up there so uh, well done to everybody for and for their ongoing work uh, in, in maintaining it as well uh, right almost there now um, during the the last 20 years um, we have been successful in several cups but to be fair we spent the majority of the time chasing the dreaded St George's in the league we have, we came second five times uh, but it was a case if we didn't beat them in the first game we would, um, we would struggle to catch them. Um, even when Steve Faulkner came along, we beat them twice in the league. We had to win our last two games to win the league, and we promptly lost both of them in 2016, which was a, 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 a bit of a letdown. But we did manage to beat them in, in some cup competitions, certainly in 2016 down at Castletown, um, and this one uh, up at Bala Fletcher, uh, and when we beat them 3-2 with... Uh, and everybody should be well known with Karen and Tom, Don McGreevy, Johnny Shields, Owen in goals, Danny Bell, who uh, recently reached 500 games for the club, um, Eric Kelly, uh, Mark Kelly, Sean Kelly, who scored two goals against us on Saturday, so I should have bleeped him out, Luke Doherty, Lee Gale, FC Isle of Man, instead of playing for Peel, but I might just forgive him, Matthew Woods, Billy Kenyuk, uh, Matthew Skillicorn, Andrew Crenell. And Reese, who unfortunately missed most of last, or all of last season with a bad injury and is still finding his way back. We won this one 3-2. Tom, Tom Wood um, putting the ball into the area in the 93rd minute and it went straight into the far post and gave them no time to get back. So that was a glorious, glorious day uh, and that way. Um, but I think since then we've lost a few players and at the moment we're a bit of a mid-table side. But we will, we will be back, I'm sure, before too long as a new young crop comes to the, the uh, fruition. Last couple now. Um, the side is, I just want to pay tribute to these, these two players here. Uh, Daniel, who's up the top there, I don't want to embarrass her, 836 appearances and counting. Stephen Corkle, 719 appearances uh, and, and still counting for the Masters uh, now and again. Uh, two tremendous servants for the club. Uh, and if we are going to be successful again, we do need servants like that, as well as uh, young up and playing, coming players too. So we're in good hands with, the, the, with a good committee as well, if we go on to the next slide. Um, but the, I think the important part of the club now is the amount of coaches we have in the junior football club set up. Um, many, many age groups and, and uh, a lot of admin there. Uh, and if they can match the... Uh, respect and uh, warmth that the club have felt towards Rowley and Terry in their work with the junior clubs, then they won't be doing a, a bad job. So, on, on to this one. So, uh, there we are. Um, if you enjoyed this evening, uh, bear with me for a couple of years because I am uh, rewriting the club's history. Uh, after that one, 34 years ago, it's time for a proper one now. Uh, but it will take two or three years. Um, if you didn't enjoy this evening, you really don't know what you're missing. Thank you. <laughs>